thank you for coming. And uh, immediately I am excuse uh, Pierre Corvol, who was expected to chair this uh, second uh, panel, but, uh, and this is pretty common at that period, he got uh, the COVID a uh, few days ago, and so he's actually very disappointed not to be here because he prepared very seriously this uh, panel. And actually, uh, I think that we need to thank very much Jean and Maria Luisa because they had to synthesize the contribution of uh, Pierre with their uh, own contributions, and so they will uh, present their uh, their effort. And so uh, y you have, I think, uh, um, yeah, y you have some slides to, to present. And so I think, uh, Jean, you are the first. Yes. I, yes. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Well, it's indeed uh, very unfortunate that uh, uh, Pierre Corvol is not here. And uh, it's even embarrassing because uh, he was supposed to chair a session on health and he's sick. <laughs> um, now, um, I think uh, the, what we just heard in the, the previous session, uh, what uh, Sylvie Goussom was saying about uh, we have two sort of uh, problems, which one are, are the models and the other one, sorry, and uh, we have the, the models and the observations. I think it is practically the same uh, in, in health. Uh, well, we have two challenges. One is to cure diseases, and the other one is to feed the planet. This is what biology and uh, health research have to do. And we are not there yet. So I think we rather uh, will concentrate on the tools we have at present. Uh, and I'm going to uh, present first tools on very basic biology, which will uh, quite overlap what... Um, uh, Janet was just saying before about Elixir, because Elixir, of course, really plays a central role in the data acquisition uh, of all those objects that we have to observe in biology and medicine. Maybe I should go to the... Well, I, can we see them from our screen, or...? Could you send the slides, please? It's... Yes, so okay. uh, it's working. Yes, I think I'm going to sit there so I, I can. It's okay. No, no, it's okay. Um, so the, the, in fact, in, in biology, uh, we have uh, two or three very basic things. One is the phenotype. So. I'm just going to explain to, to the physicists and to uh, social scientists that are here, because the biologists can just, uh, they don't need those explanations, they know them much better than even maybe I do. Um, the, the phenotype is what we can observe, the observations we can make. And this phenotype is influenced by the environment and is of course also under the control of the genotype. So we have those three things have uh, very, very, uh, are very important. And um, the, the phenotype is something that is quite complex. Uh, in very old days, a century ago, you could just define a phenotype by what you can see, which are uh, the, uh, the the organisms, uh, roughly saying, and uh, this has been, of course, now much more uh, sophisticated, simply because uh, we have uh, ways to observe living systems which are much more uh, performant than what we had before, and especially thanks to the progresses in in mainly in physics, I would say. Um, so uh, this uh, uh, phenotype uh, is the result of the action of the environment uh, on our uh, genotype, roughly. Um, and uh, this is an example that is driven from uh, plant science. And uh, in fact, you see on, on the left uh, a number of uh, pictures. And you also see on the, on the very left, you see uh, a column with cell, tissue, organ, whole plant, uh, canopy. 
So what is true, obviously, uh, for plants is also true for other uh, living systems. And the first thing you do when you want to observe, uh, you take images, uh, which are just on the, ne on the next panel, and from uh, those images, you can uh, draw uh, the phenotypes. I'm not going to, 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 go, uh, to discuss this uh, in detail. And the, those phenotypes are of different kinds, as explained with the, the color code that is used here. And for uh, animal systems, it's exactly the same. And um, uh, this time, I went back not to the most highly organized structures uh, in living systems, but I went uh, to the most to the to the simple. You have the animal, and then you have uh, you can have uh, tissue and organs which are not represented here. You have cells, then you have subcellular objects, macromolecules, and small molecules, and you have to integrate all this. And so, uh, observing um, living systems goes from observing small molecules to the biosphere. And this is a very huge range, as you can imagine. And this is just, in fact, one dimension. This, uh, the, the, the different sizes of uh, those uh, um, objects. And uh, uh, the, the complication comes also from the fact that you have other dimensions. One other dimension is the, the time, because a, a living system has a life which uh, spans over a, a, a given uh, amount of time uh, from birth to death. And this is a second dimension. The third one is that with a single genotype, in fact, you uh, can have, I think I should go to the next one, you can have, uh, with a single genotype, uh, you can have um, variations within this genotype, and those variations will result in variations in the phenotype. And this is uh, uh, another dimension. And then you have a fourth one, uh, which is the environment uh, that I, I already mentioned. And uh, living systems uh, live in the environment and are uh, influenced by what they eat, by what they breathe, etc. So uh, the different components of the environment have a very important uh, effect also on the expression of the phenotype. Uh, here also in, in the bottom of this slide, you have a number of uh, items uh, corresponding to the smaller molecules, uh, which are also extremely important. So you have to observe at all those different levels uh, the, the different kinds of uh, characteristics. You have to observe the small molecules, the metabolites, you have to observe proteins, you have to observe the transcripts, the genomes, etc., etc. And all for all this, uh, you need, of course, uh, uh, infrastructures. So this, is, this slide uh, just gives you uh, the multi-scale observation range that you have for uh, biological uh, objects, going from, again, small molecules, atoms, up to the biosphere. Biosphere, of course, uh, bringing us to the previous uh, round table uh, with the environment. Um, now, when you look at the right side, uh, you can see that Elixir, for instance, is gathering data from all those different observational ranges, perhaps not all of them, but at, at least a, a substantial subset. And the uh, images also are being collected by uh, other infrastructures. And then, a uh, little bit more to the left, you have a column with the different S3s that are existing at present. So you have the feeling that most of the range uh, in terms of size is covered, but this is not true because uh, uh, for, for each range, uh, the situation is much more complex. For instance, if we take the, uh, the, the level of macromolecules, we have nucleic acids, we have proteins, we have polysaccharides, etc. If you take the, the, the level of subcellular objects, again, 
you have assemblies of proteins, you have nuclear proteins, you have things like that. Uh, and in a certain number of cases you have the infrastructures which are there. Instruct is a very important uh, uh, one. But in other cases, in fact, there are still, uh, especially for the smaller, for, for the macromolecules and for the, you have, um, in many cases, infrastructures at the national levels, but not at the international level. And uh, the last thing I want to say, or the, just before the, uh, is um, the, all the, those different uh, observation levels are interconnected. For instance, if you take in red the viruses, viruses have effects on cells, on organs, uh, on the ecosystem uh, in general. And uh, this is true, in fact, for most of the different uh, uh, objects that are being uh, observed here. And uh, perhaps to stop, uh, just to say that uh, uh, on top of the infrastructures that we have, um, uh, that, we, uh, that uh, I, I, I mentioned before, uh, we have to take, of course, in account, uh, and this is also a challenge, uh, to be a, as open as possible. Uh, uh, Elixir is doing a, a very good job in that uh, area, but there are, there are problems. Uh, research integrity, of course, we, it's like uh, everywhere. Um, perhaps one thing I should add is the problem of integration of all the different data I, I was just saying. So we are just, uh, just to come back to the, the two uh, observations and modeling, we are still, in, I would say, in the observation range uh, concerning modeling in uh, uh, biological systems. Uh, it, this is completely in its infancy for the moment. Well, I'll stop here. <coughs> okay. So, Maria Luisa. So, so good afternoon. Now is my turn, and um, and and actually. I will talk about uh, health. health. Health, which is a, a major concern for any citizens and also for governments. If more like this, yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay. Like that, like that. Okay. Uh, we heard how technologies, advanced technologies, helped to understand biology. But thanks to advanced technologies, medicine is more and more now oriented towards the cure of a single patient with a personalized approach. In fact, we are in the era of personalized medicine and precision medicine. That means more effective clinical treatment. Personalized medicine aims to improve stratification and timing of health care by utilizing biological information and biomarkers on the level of molecular disease pathways, genetics, proteomics, as well as metabolomics and radiomics. And current advances in molecular techniques have provided new tools facilitating the discovery of new biomarkers. And these emerging biomarkers will be beneficial and critical in developing new and clinically reliable indicators that will have a high specificity for diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of diseases. Biomarkers are important because allow to select the right drug for the right patient and to accelerate drug development and approval, which also have a, a big market value of about 50 million of euros. Now, in this context, research infrastructure really plays a crucial role. Um, plays a crucial role. Research infrastructure cover the whole spectrum of research discovery and development of health challenges with synergy and complementarity from target identification and validation to drug discovery and development through biomarkers identification and validation to translational and finally clinical research. The life science research infrastructures provide access to high-end facilities and services for biological and medical research, from human samples to mice models, 
imaging technologies to chemical screening and data analysis, plus providing also advice on ethical, legal, and societal issues in biomedical research. As an example, as it has been several times today, uh, to support the global effort to tackle the coronavirus pandemic, life sciences infrastructure prioritized the COVID-19 research. In the COVID outbreak, patient care had and still has the highest priority. But the next challenge, however, was to support those who were finding a cure for COVID-19. This was a challenging situation because falls in the area between clinical care, public health, and research. And the European research infrastructures joined forces and provided key services to address the need to do research for a better understanding of COVID-19 and to improve the clinical and public health response. It was urgent to know the biological resources that can be made available to researchers and share relevant information with the scientific community to facilitate progress in the knowledge of the virus. In this context, BBMRI ERIC played an important role. BBMRI ERIC is a distributed research infrastructure of biobanks and biomolecular resources. And BBMRI enable biobanks to work with high quality samples and associated data and support controlled access to the wider research community being a true gateway to health. Human biological materials, both samples and data, is the most critical resource for translating advances in molecular biology and technologies into improved human health. Biological samples are in fact at the center of translational research, from clinic to discovery to technology transfer to clinic. Biobanks are crucial, uh, were crucial actually, in the run towards a COVID-19 vaccine and treatment. BBMRI national nodes and biobank organize an efficient and high quality storage of samples in clinical and research setting. 88 biobanks collected more than 490 samples and the related data set from 92,000 donors. Samples and data were available to researchers from academic and from the private sector for target identification through high throughput screening supporting diagnostic, genotyping, phenotyping, and drug repurposing. BBMRI also offered guidance on ethical, regulatory, and legal issues in EU member states for research on COVID. Now, the COVID case is an important example for developing health data integration in Europe. We could react quickly because we were already working towards transnational access of samples and data within the S3 research infrastructure. Starting point from, for BBMRI, but also for Elixir, as we learned very well from Janet Thornton, and also Ecrin, where the, uh, where the national node uh, with, the, with the national node. Many of the nodes were asked to support the national effort to set up infrastructure in the pandemic. Now, I mean, Elixir was well, um, you know, described by Janet and uh, it mobilized data via the national portals, broker virus sequences into open research repositories. Four million open SARS-CoV-2 genomes were published and uh, Elixir connect different ty data types across disciplines into the European COVID-19 data um, platform to allow researchers to easily find and combine data for analysis. Clinical research is also a critical step for the development and optimization for solution for treatment prevention and diagnostic of diseases. ECRAN, a distributed research infrastructure supporting multinational clinical research in Europe, provide support to the planning and design of multinational clinical studies and operational services to, to the management of the trials. In the context of the COVID-19 outbreak, ECRIN supports the EU-funded COVID treatment uh, platform trials on primary care, hospitalized or intensive care patients, and also vaccine platform trials on aged adult or children volunteers. 
have set up a, a trial coordinator board for the coordination between principal investigators of major platform trials in dialogue with regulators, industry patients, and policymakers. And also has established a joint um, access advisory mechanism for scientific assessment for candidate treatment arms for EU-funded platform trials for in the primary care, in the hospitalized patients, and also uh, in intensive care. From what I said, uh, the benefit of using established research infrastructure were clear. Research infrastructure were ready and able to provide expert advice and resources to meet a variety of research needs. Challenge now is preparedness. To take the massive research and development effort over the last two years and make sure that this can be used also for other infectious disease, if suddenly will happen, and also in other fields of life science. A lot of very good things were done very quickly. The best bits needs to be put in sustainable platform so they can be used for future studies. Uh, now, maybe I can present, um, if I'm allowed, the Pierre Corval uh, slides, two slides, if I, oh, there is time or not. Well, we are already no. out of time, okay. but uh, no, take a few minutes to for this presentation. Because, uh, uh, just to say uh, that uh, another field where research infrastructure were very useful is the rare disease field. Rare diseases are diseases that affect not more than five um, per uh, 10,000 person. And the lack of specific health policies for rare diseases and the scarcity of expertise translated to delayed diagnosis, few medicinal products, and difficult access to, to care. And this is why the rare diseases are prime example of a research area where strongly profit from the coordination on an European scale. So maybe this is the message. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, I think that we can uh, thank uh, uh, Jean, Jean and uh, Maria Luisa because uh, they <laughs> thank you for them. some rush and so thank you very much for for your effort and uh, and for this very interesting presentation okay so uh, quickly we will switch to the last uh, panel and uh, and so I, I call um, Sebastian Candel who will chair this uh, last uh, panel So, and, and uh, Philippe Rioufré from uh, Safran Reosc and uh, Anton Houssi uh, from uh, Eatris accepted to participate to this uh, last panel. Thank you for again. May, may I have the, uh, my first slide, please? Yes. So, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, uh, to handle this uh, roundtable. Uh, this will be about uh, industry involvement in research infrastructures. In fact, uh, during the day, I didn't uh, hear very much about industry, so I think it's important to, to speak about that and, uh, and see the relations that can be, uh, that, that can be, uh, that can link industry with these infrastructures. And uh, I have some, uh, the two panelists, uh, Philippe uh, Rioufré, who is a CEO of a company, a small, medium-sized company, uh, Reosc. Reosc is producing large-scale optics. And then Anton uh, Yussi is, uh, is the CEO of the, uh, an infrastructure that was just mentioned in one of the slides before. And this is uh, the, uh, uh, it, it is called EATRIS. So uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the amount of time allocated to this, let me go to the next, whoops, that's not it. Which one is this? This is it. Yes, 
uh, in this small amount of time, uh, I would like, whoops, is it, yeah, no, next, sorry, yeah. Uh, I would like, uh, first of all, to, um, uh, to ask a few questions. What are the questions? One of them is, uh, are we, uh, is there a, a sufficient relationship between industry and uh, these infrastructures? Uh, do they, uh, do they um, uh, take into account industrial needs? Uh, do they participate in the development of uh, technological capacities in Europe? The second one is uh, if we expand uh, the scientific and technological frontiers, uh, can they enhance uh, competitiveness of European industry? This is a very important aspect. And the third one is what sort of vision, what, what can we do in the future uh, in this area? And uh, I would like to share with you some of my own research that was uh, actually using an infrastructure. This is called PRACE. I didn't hear also about PRACE, but we feel in, in our community that it's quite important. It's about high-performance computing. High-performance computing is essential in many activities, including uh, climate modeling, for example, but not only. It is very important in engineering. And I would like uh, to, to tell you a little bit about that and show how uh, fundamental research can actually cope with uh, industrial needs. All right, so next. Uh, I was uh, happy to, uh, to be part of the initial uh, work workshop that uh, discussed the possibility of putting up praise. This took place in 2010, so it's about 12 years ago. We felt that we needed very large scale capacities, resources to do calculations. And I want to show how indeed we, we need them. Uh, I also found uh, in my computer the agenda of that meeting, but I won't go into all these details. So anyway, this uh, praise was set up and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the idea is that computing drives science and technology and uh, science and technology raises frontier challenges to computing. So this is a very good dialogue. And of course, this dialogue is, is going to, could be used, in fact, for engineering applications. So um, uh, this uh, praise, praise means uh, um, a partnership for advanced computing in Europe. And uh, this offers the infrastructure to access very large scale computing resources. Uh, it supports all the scientific disciplines. Uh, there are five hosting members who have the, the, the computational resources and 26 members participate to praise. And uh, what you could try to remember is that it gives you 62 petaflops in seven complementary leading edge systems. What is a petaflop? A petaflop is a million times a billion of flops uh, of uh, floating point operations per second. So it's a very large number, and it's important for many applications. And uh, the total is 4 million, 4,000 million core hours per year. So let me now go to a, a small example, one of the examples of using this, this. And this is in rocket science. We, we are interested in having launchers in Europe, like uh, the Ariane launcher, and we want to have the engines operate properly. These engines operate in extreme conditions. The pressure is very high. It is above the critical point uh, of oxygen. The pressure is about 100 atmospheres inside this engine. Uh, we have also some test benches where we can reproduce, at least in part, what happens in the engine. 
The engine is fed with liquid oxygen and gaseous hydrogen. Uh, the oxygen is at low temperature and then uh, it reacts with hydrogen. Uh, there are many complexities in this, uh, in this, uh, in this engine. For example, you have 500 injectors when I take a shower, I always think about the back plane of the rocket engine. And uh, so it's a big shower cap <laughs> and with these 500 injectors. The hydrogen is injected at 200 meters per second. And nevertheless, the flame is stuck inside the, the combustor. So this, is, this was a mystery, in fact, in the early days of when we started doing research on that. It's very fundamental research. So one, one something else is that uh, in one of these engines, you expand a power of 2.5 gigawatts. So it's like two times a power plant is there in, a, in something which is like 50 liters. So it's a very, very high level of power. Now, one of the problems of these engines is that they may have combustion instabilities and this can be very harmful. And so we study that. Uh, this has been a topic on which we have worked. I mean, a whole community has worked to, to be able to have uh, stable engines. Uh, here you see a facility where we can do experiments. And uh, this facility is equipped. It, of course, we, we burn oxygen and hydrogen at, at 70 bars, not quite the, uh, the pressure in the engine. And uh, we are able to create in this facility, using a special device, a sound field that is above 200 decibels. This is per perhaps the world record in, uh, in making noise. It, of course, it's inside the box. It's not outside. But nevertheless, it's a very, very st uh, strong uh, level of oscillations. And this oscillate the flames. And as a consequence, we can see what happens when you have an instability. Now, going to the numerics, it is now possible to calculate these complex flows. Uh, it has been a very long uh, effort to be able to do so because everything is complicated. It's turbulent, it's reactive, it's high pressure, uh, it is uh, multiple injectors, the geometry is complex. It's unstable, uh, it, uh, uh, you have acoustics, so everything is there. So it's not only multi-scale, but it's also multi-physics. And uh, what you see here is just the, uh, the, the gridding, the mesh that we use to do this. The mesh is very large. As a consequence, the computational load is very high. And typically, one of the calculations that I'm going to show takes a million hours. Now, a million hours is like one century. So how can you do a million hours when your life is not, not a century? Well, you do it in parallel, and this is um, uh, amazing. And so again, it's a new technology that, not, not so new anymore, but fairly new, and, uh, and this allows us to do these calculations. And this is what I want to show. In principle, this should stop, but they don't. It's a film, doesn't matter. And so uh, what we see here is on one side, uh, the uh, five flames, which are not, uh, perhaps, let me see if, if it doesn't, no, it doesn't start. It does? Yeah. So you see on, on that side, flames which are not submitted to the acoustic field, so they, they develop. These are hydrogen, oxygen flames, and, uh, and they, they develop nicely. And now, on the other side, you see what happens when you have a strong acoustic field. The, uh, the combustion region is much more compact, and as a consequence, this will put a high load, uh, high, high uh, thermal load on the, on the walls of this uh, combustor. And, uh, and in, in fact, what, what we've seen here retrieves what you find in the experiments. You can see here uh, uh, images of the flames under the conditions without acoustics. This is uh, at the top. 
and with acoustics, this is at the, at the bottom. So you see high performance simulations retrieve the structure and dynamics of the transcritical combustion process in this multiple injector combustor. It's a complicated problem, uh, but we have now the tools and the resources to do, to, to calculate that. And of course, if you are able to calculate, you can, you can handle the process, you master the process. All right. So let me now uh, go to my next two uh, um, table, uh, round table uh, uh, colleagues. And uh, our questions uh, are set again here. Uh, what are the relations with these infrastructures? Uh, uh, do they, uh, do they, um, uh, are they in touch with the industrial needs? Um, can we do better in the future? In, in using what, what is uh, available to enhance the competitiveness and what sort of vision do we have for the future. And uh, I would like to now give the podium to uh, uh, Philippe Rioufray. Thank you. It's not the, the right presentation. The right one. Uh, I, I, I can. Uh, So I'm Anton from Eatris. <laughs> um, it's uh, great to be here today. So I hope I'm going to write the way. So uh, we already heard from, from Maria Luisa today and, and a lot of the, the life sciences researchers and, and uh, infrastructures, how complex it is. Um, and, and I think w what we have to realize is, is how much of a black box the human body still is and how it takes a very long time to actually understand that sufficiently to be able to find out what's going wrong for a specific disease and turn that into a medicine that doesn't kill you, but actually makes you better. Uh, industry calculates that it costs them around two billion, two and a half billion per single medicine that they make because they have to fail many, many medicines on the long way, on the, on the road, because it's a very, very, very empirical process. And it takes a long time, 12 to 15 years. COVID was amazing because there was so much fundamental research done on the virus itself already, so that's the scientific community already preparing the ground there, but also because incredible amounts of money was thrown at it. So within just a few months, the Atras, we had more than 30 projects coming in from companies that had never done COVID research before because there was huge amounts of attention and money and everybody's going, ooh, exciting. And so uh, that, that was a very unusual thing, but normally it's a very difficult, long process and it takes more than a village. They say that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, to make a medicine, it takes a city at least, and you're probably still gonna fail at that. And you really have to create an ecosystem that involves the industrial process. It involves the academic and the creativity and the understanding of the biology. You have to be patient-centric and working with the patient and their clinicians and their caregivers to understand what's going on at the bedside and inside. And obviously the regulator is a hugely important person and, and, and agency in that. And you have to really have this ecosystem around you. And at certain points, you have to be able to, to bring the right people around the table. It's very, very multidisciplinary. When you're developing a medicine from the basic to the, to the end, just within science, you're probably gonna have to have on your critical path, probably 20, 30 different scientific disciplines. And then on top of that, you're gonna need your medical professionals and your IT specialists and everybody else. And it's global now, and it's multi-sectoral now. And, and you can't avoid that in this knowledge journey, this, this life cycle of knowledge from the publication to the patient. It's unavoidable to have to be able to access and work closely with all of these different sectors. Because the only way we can make a new medicine is to bring the biological insights so the people who understand that pathway understand what's going wrong with that pathway. The clinicians who know what's going wrong with the patient understand the presentation of the disease and the phenotype, plus the technologists who know how to operate those machines. 
And no single machine tells you everything. So just like Professor Gensel's wonderful presentation today, you have to triangulate little bits of information. You're putting a puzzle of imperfect knowledge together, and eventually you have enough confidence to say, I think this is actually a good hypothesis, and I might be able to develop it. So Iatra's uh, in translational research is, is trying to support this process, this multidisciplinarity. So with industry specifically, they access us. So about 30% of our portfolio of users is uh, mostly small, medium enterprise, but also large pharma, ranging from Japanese to European to, to other areas. We develop new technologies together. We support the regula regulatory science process as well because new technologies come along and if there isn't a transparent regulatory process, it's hard to innovate because you don't know what you have to prove if you don't know what the problem is. And in innovation management, we have to help that seedbed, that, that smart academic scientist, we have to help them make their data set ready for a venture capitalist or a company to say, wow, this is exciting, we want to make a medicine from this. And that's not done very commonly and very easily, and the competences are very varying in quality, so we're working hard to try and support those processes. So we really are in a very multi, like the, along the whole knowledge life cycle, we're trying to work with industry and utilize industry strengths, and they utilize our strengths. Uh, so for instance, in the top right, the blue one, Enrich, is a project um, which is actually bringing a peer network of the people in infrastructures that deal with industry, trying to do best practice uh, collaboration and, and uh, exchange, and really help us advance as a network of, of, of uh, industry outreach offices, and the offices that also bring companies uh, who's, uh, who will supply the infrastructures with their technologies. We work with large pharma companies to develop new tools. How can we look into the body better? How can we track the, the performance of our drug? Is it engaging the target uh, tissue well to, to do that? That takes millions and millions of euros and, and lot, many, many years to develop new tools. We work in the joint program of rare diseases um, uh, where we provide industry mentoring to high value rare disease research projects. We develop new methods, for instance, together with ECRON, we're in EU Pearl and IMI project to develop new clinical trial methodologies that's better for patients. And of course, the patient is at the heart of what we do. So we work with several patient advocacy groups like the European Patient Forum uh, in order to make this process smoother. Industry should be everywhere in our process and that we should be everywhere in their process. The problem is it's very difficult. This is a thank you to all the member states that support us in this mission. The problem is, it takes at that nexus, at that point where you want to sit at the table with industry, it takes specific competences and expertise. And a lot of infrastructures aren't given the resources or the attention or the mandate to say, do this. And so that there, I think, is something we as ESFRI, as, as this community, can share competences, learn how to sit at the table with different sectors. And I think that's, that's something that we can do together as a, as a community. And I'd like to talk more about that in the future with people, if I can. I'll stop there and hand over to Philippe. So good, good afternoon to all of you. I am very proud to be here and uh, share with you uh, USA Fonreo's participation to major research infrastructure programs as fed on develop uh, its industrial activity. Okay, what is, what is Safonreosk? Uh, it has been created in uh, 1937 by a group of scientists of, from the uh, Paris Institute of Optics uh, with objective to spread technology uh, from science to industry. Uh, it was the, the startup of the time. We are a small company, uh, 180 persons, uh, and we are a subsidiary, a 100 person subsidiary of Safran Electronics on, dif on Defense from Safran Group. Our skill is to develop uh, optics uh, of high performance uh, on thin film coating. Our field of expertise are astronomy, uh, space, defense, and industry. 
we have um, a long history, a long, a long history in, uh, in astronomy from our beginnings and from the, the creation of uh, the European Southern Observatory. We, 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 had, we had been present uh, since the 60s uh, with the first spectrometer, we, in the 70s with the first uh, 3.6 meter uh, uh, telescope with a very large telescope, we did the eight meters mirrors, the four eight meter mirrors, and now we are involved in the extremely large telescope. And for space, we, uh, uh, we begin to, to, to work uh, at, in the late 17th, and we are now uh, uh, making a lot of uh, space optics. Uh, in the next slides, I will take two examples to, to show you how uh, we, we try to, uh, to take uh, our technology and bring it to different fields. So, the, the first... Uh, the first example is the extremely large telescope. Uh, for that uh, telescope, we, um, we won uh, the four main, uh, the, the five uh, main uh, optics. Uh, the, the, um, the European Southern Observatory uh, Extremely Large Telescope, we, as stated this morning, uh, will be the world's largest and most powerful optical telescope in the world. Uh, its, its size will be four to five times more than the current ones. For the primary mirror, for us, the challenge is to produce more than 931 segments from 1.5 meter. To do this, uh, we will have to deliver one mirror per day during three years, compared to a few mirrors per year currently. To achieve this, we, have, we had to build uh, a completely new dedicated plant in Poitiers. The polishing of each of the mirrors must guarantee an almost perfect image reproduction of stars located thousands of light years away. Surface defects uh, should not exceed 15 nanometers. It would be equi equivalent to a ladybug if each segment was on the scale of France. Secondary and tertiary mirrors uh, are four meter glass ceramic monolithics produ produced in our, um, in our very large optic facility. In the time of a very large telescope, we did there the eight meters mirrors. And uh, we had also uh, the opportunity uh, to carry out the polishing of the two inter international Gemini uh, eight meter mirrors after VLT. The fourth mirror is a glass fin shell less than two millimeter thick to, uh, uh, for the adaptive optics of the telescope. Uh, the technology, and I, I am quite proud to announce that the technology we develop for this, uh, for the ELT, uh, gave us a competitive advantage to win the fin shell of the American giant Magellan telescope. My second example uh, will be the growth of, of our large silicium carbide mirror technology. Since the end of the 19th, we, are, we had a major cooperation with Airbus on silicon carbon mirrors. The materials give our mirror better mechanical and thermal uh, performances. We have had the opportunity to develop, uh, to develop this technology thanks to our participation in major European programs. You can see here the one meter mirror from Gaia. Uh, the 1.2 uh, mirror from Euclid, some uh, free-form optics for, uh, um, uh, for microcarb, uh, CO2, uh, carbon monitoring, and the, 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 the ELT uh, M5, which will be in silicon carbide, and you see uh, one part of, uh, of the final mirror, with, with, which is uh, yet cast. 
as we, as we mastered this technology, we have been able to win a new project on international contract. So uh, here you have an example uh, at the beginning uh, in 2000 of the uh, Indian, uh, Indian Meteorological Mission for which we did the primary mirror. Uh, the second one is the co cooperation for a James Webb Space Telescope where we did uh, three mirror and a stigma. Uh, and so we, we did more than 30 mirrors for the GWST. Uh, and the third one is, uh, um, is our involvement uh, in all the mirrors of the new Pleiad Neo constellation from Airbus, uh, which uh, is in the process of offering commercial Earth observation services. Two satellites were launched last year. So going forward, uh, I will mention two challenges. Uh, the first one yeah, is the need uh, for us to develop high-level resources uh, and to manage expertise over time. We must support training through research on technology uh, on networks of experts. Uh, the second is to give uh, for us, uh, uh, our objective is to give scientists the tools they need to their discoveries. Uh, I have heard this morning uh, Reinhard Genzel speaking about the breakthrough realized uh, on black holes with a very large telescope. Uh, Safran Verosk is very excited to enable him on the astronomy community uh, to pursue and boost uh, their discoveries with the next extremely large telescope. So thank you very much for your attention. Just, uh, one, uh, one short minute to, to give some uh, take home messages. The first one is that uh, infrastructures are a key resource to industry and uh, industry is a key collaborator in the long journey from discovery to society. The second one is that uh, they can enhance competitiveness uh, for business, as illustrated by Philippe. And the third one is that uh, infrastructures like PRACE uh, play a strategic uh, role, especially for simulation. So I, tr I think uh, we illustrated that, perhaps not in the best conditions, but we tried to. So thank you. So I think it's time to thank all of the participants to the three panels. And uh, I agree that uh, you, you participate in a pretty tough conditions because of the time constraint. And so I know that you had a lot of things to say, but I think it's time to, to continue and to finish this uh, wonderful day. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you very much, the uh, dear speakers. Anyway, we are planning to go on with stakeholders' dialogues, as it was announced already several times today. So we will certainly come back to, to all of these questions in details. So now I think we have to uh, go to the most festive part of our day. We, we have uh, uh, free Eric's uh, to celebrate today. Eric is the Euro European Research Infrastructure Consortium. So they were created lately. We didn't have a chance to, to give them the, the trophy uh, because we, we never met before in, in physical meetings. So um, I uh, invite to this uh, stage uh, again uh, Jean-Éric Paquet, the Director General for Research and Innovation uh, from the uh, European Commission, and Jana Collard, our new chair, yes, free, uh, and they will master this uh, ceremony. My God, just quite a few Thank you, in the room. Good afternoon. Oh. And the last time I did that was in 2019. Another era, really. Okay, very nice. They look the same, I just reassure. 
les récipiendaires d'aujourd'hui. Very nice. So, uh, just, just to say what this is about, Elena already briefly introduced uh, ERICs uh, are based on ERIC regulation, which was, uh, 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 which was uh, made in 2009. Since then, 23 ERICs were created, and all of them, so European Research Infrastructure Consortium, and all of them receive an ERIC uh, plate. So uh, due to the pandemic, we have three this time. So I pass the floor to Jean-Éric. First of all, to give the plaque to Eurobio Imaging, Eric. Absolutely. Can I call a Eurobio Imaging, Eric, to the stage, please? <laughs> and you are doing exceptionally important work already. So this is really a little bit uh, late, but I'm really delighted to hand it over. Uh, after so many years. Thank you very much. Yeah. Congratulations. So I think in the past two years, uh, people and everybody have noticed that small things in life make a big difference to our health and our societies. Small things, invisible things, those are the job of Eurobiomaging, both in terms of things that we cannot see with the naked eye, but also things that are inside our body uh, that we cannot see without um, uh, entering the body. We have devices spanning everything from really small things to uh, things that are of body size. Uh, there's a lot of need in this respect uh, to carry on research with, uh, it, which is relevant for health and for disease. You need these devices, you need these technologies, you need the know-how, um, and you also need data management and you need the continuum to the wonderful uh, infrastructures that are pro providing big data, the omics data, and we have many of them here aboard. Um, to serve this need, we have uh, 33 nodes, so we are a distributed infrastructure, and they are covering altogether 148 platforms, more than 50 technologies. We have uh, a tripartite hub, uh, the headquarters, so the seat is in Finland, uh, the biological section is in Heidelberg, in EMBL, uh, and I have Antti Kepler here, who is the section director uh, at EMBL, and then we have a medical node in Torino, um, where Linda Shaban is the section director. Uh, due to the circumstances that Jean-Eric already referred to, this is a little bit overdue, uh, but we're really, really happy that we can be here under this nice circumstances, uh, sharing our small moment with so many people that we actually know already, many of them, and we look forward to the future collaboration with the infrastructures. And also, we want to thank all the organizations, hosting organizations, ministries, uh, and so forth, and of course, the team members that have enabled uh, this to come through. So, thank you very much. John, thank you. And should you want to, you're good? And John, you will, you will tell us afterwards uh, where it goes, the plaque. Thank you very much, congratulations. Thank you very much, congratulations. Eli Eric. Eli, so that's Alan. Alan, welcome. And the Eli Eric, I think, is the demonstration that uh, setting up a European infrastructure is challenging sometimes, political always, but successful ever. Congratulations, Alan. Thank you very much. You should open it and show it on the photo. Thank you, dear. Shall I? Yes, take it up. Do you see that? Thank you very much. 
I will try. To, I will try to be brief, but I do have to. Um, I got to go by my notes. Otherwise, I'm going to forget a few things. Um, so, thank you very much, Director General, for this. Thank you, Yana, for this. Um, this is a, a great honor for me personally to accept these plates because I'm accepting them on behalf of a lot of people, um, scientists, engineers, people that have made Eli possible over a very long period of time. Uh, it's a confirmation for Eli um, to their dedication and the excellence they put into that and to make it a reality. About a week ago, we had our General Assembly meeting and I met Katharina Petrillo, uh, who's our uh, chair, and she said, um, Alan, you look tired. Uh, and that's how she always greets people, right? <laughs> And I said, uh, no, I look old, or at least older, uh, and raising children will do that to you. And um, Eli is also older, um, but not in the gray way that I'm getting older. Eli is older in the sense of a child, uh, a child that's becoming a teenager or an adolescent. So in an optimistic way, in an energetic way, uh, this is not the birth of Eli. This is uh, a different part in the life cycle. Uh, so those of me who know me know I tend to exaggerate these analogies, so I apologize a little bit. Um, Eli is also a child raised by a village. Uh, many, bi there's not many biological parents, a biological parent perhaps, uh, Gerard Moreau is the French Nobel laureate who really conceived of Eli. It's, it's difficult to point to one person and say, but I can, in our case we can say in many ways that Gerard is the biological father of Eli here at CNRS uh, in France with the support. Um, and I think he was able to launch uh, Eli in the preparation phase. Um, we had another parent of Eli, so to say, and that's Wolfgang Zander, who took over Eli in 2000 uh, and, and really formed the delivery consortium um, and really birthed Eli in a way. Uh, Wolfgang unfortunately passed in 2015, unexpectedly of course, uh, and I think that could have been a real challenge and it was a real challenge for Eli at the time. Uh, it was a very critical time when we were starting construction and it could have arrested the development of the facility for a very long time. Um, it certainly left a mark on our organization. Uh, but we had the luck of having the custody of the organization, the infant organization, being taken over by, if I can say, its godfather. I hope you appreciate that reference. Uh, its spiritual father, in a way, Carlo Rosuto, uh, who led it through a very critical time and I think got the organization stabilized and back on track. And um, those of you who know, you know Carlo has nurtured many research infrastructures, not only Eli, uh, he's also nurtured S3, he's nurtured Eric's in general, so we were, we were very lucky in that sense. Uh, and Carlo brought me on board, Eli, in 2017. Um, and I'm here to collect the plates, that's, that's what I do. Um, but the community around Eli, as Anton said, uh, it takes a, a, a village uh, to raise a child. Um, this is an African proverb. There are many versions of that. One translation of that is that the biological parents bear the child and, and the community raises it. Uh, and I think that's pretty much the case with Eli. Uh, we have many benefactors, uh, but I particularly have to say that the host countries, the Czech Republic and, and, and Hungary, have been so strong and so uh, consistent in their commitment to Eli uh, should never be doubted. Um, particularly Minister Plaga in the Czech Republic, former minister and particular uh, Minister Palkovich in Hungary. Um, and then, you know, both countries used over 600 million euro in structural funds that they dedicated to a facility that's open to Europe and to the world. Uh, it's not their facility, it's Europe's facility. Uh, and I think all of us can appreciate that and take the benefit from that. Uh, we're very fortunate also that Italy at a very critical time took a lead in becoming the third member so that we could establish the ERIC. Without that support, I think we, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, we're also very fortunate that Lithuania, who is a, a real leader in the laser community, even though it's a country of only one million people, uh, also decided to join as a founding country. Lithuania is also fighting a brave battle today as a lonely country, again, uh, against a large organization, a large country uh, in their battle with China right now. So we should keep that in mind as well. It certainly affects us in the laser community. Um, Germany is a founding observer of ELI, uh, as well as Bulgaria. Uh, and without their support, I think, uh, again, it would, it would be a different kind of Eric. Uh, I have a list of people, but it's not the Academy Awards, so I can only say thank you to, <laughs> you know. Particularly, I want to thank uh, Lukas Levak and, and my colleague uh, Florian Glickson, who've been with the project for a very long time. Okay, so with that, Eli is um, older, it's maturing, but it's not old. It's at the very beginning, uh, and, and I'm very happy that we're here to kind of have this confirmation or acceptance 
into the European community. I think it's very important to a lot of people who've worked with Eli and for most people who've been involved in ESRI because Eli, as you all know, has been on the ESRI roadmap since 2006. So it's, I think, important to close the loop on that. And today we do that. Uh, so thank you very much. So we have our first formal opening call in May of this year. We will accept users uh, and we're very excited to, to do that uh, in October. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah, a somehow turbulent child as well, Alan, at, at, at times. Uh, but thank you very much. And yes, over. and the third one uh, that was established last is an, also an S3 uh, research infrastructure, which is Anna and Eric. Please join us on the floor. Michel Boer. Michel, vous avez, vous avez attendu beaucoup moins longtemps que les autres, puisque je crois que vous avez été établi euh, très récemment. Bienvenue. Have been established in February. Congratulations. So thank you very much. Merci. So uh, thank you, Yana, and thank you, uh, Jean-Eric. And uh, yes, and I sh should say that we are very proud. It was a long exciting uh, process uh, and, uh, uh, and our application uh, as an Eric took yeah, say more than 10 years so it's it's nice to, to be an Eric now and also to be a, a, a rich research infrastructure and S3 research infrastructure uh, and I should thank all the colleagues and people that have really worked hard and were committed to get these results and also the sustained support of the commission of the S3 and S3 delegates and, uh, uh, and for also their advice. Uh, and I, Eric is about understanding the processes and uh, functions that are to work uh, on ecosystems and for that it uses uh, original methods, which is in fact the scientific experimental methods that you have hypothesis, you test the hypothesis experimentally, and then get back to the model. Um, so uh, we put the ecosystems under pressure. I'm not sure this is very green, but uh, <laughs> we, what we test is exactly what it will be the behavior, high CO2 levels, uh, draft, uh, etc., and also management practices to see what is the resilience and adaptations and mitigation measures. And you can see behind me some examples of platforms uh, uh, that can be installed in the open air or in highly controlled uh, enclosed chamber called Ecotrans. And the data are collected, checked, and interpreted thanks to the model, which leads, of course, a better uh, understanding of the functionings of these ecosystems and how they react to the changing environment. Uh, and this is not all, because thanks to the modeling and the experimentation, we are able also to foster and to test the adaptation and mitigation measures that can be taken, including the management techniques. In short, and more generally, uh, experimental NIE and uh, experimental ecology is contributing to the building of strategies for safeguarding ecosystem services with their benefits for the society. So it's. Uh, both fundamental and impact uh, uh, research. Uh, by the way, uh, at least we collaborate with one of the infrastructure, Euro Bioimaging, uh, through a proposal and, uh, uh, on agroecology. And agroecology is among the ways to reach a sustainable and healthy food systems. And NIE, together with many partners, is coordinating a very large transdisciplinary project called AgroServe. Uh, with 12 RIs and your bioimaging among them uh, in the domain of resilience and sustainability of agriculture and agroecological transitions. This is a clear uh, illustration of one of the impact of ANAE and more generally of the infrastructure in this domain, both scientific and uh, societal. Uh, thank you again for kind words, for support, and uh, long life, of course, to ANAE. Thank you very much. We've come to the end, and I'm, inv uh, I'm inviting again Elena 
to join us on the floor and take us through the uh, final closing. Closing statement. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jana. Thank you, Mr. Director General. Um, just f uh, closing this uh, wonderful conference, I, um, we, we, d we thought it would be very important to have final statements from our, our presidency, from the upcoming presidency, and uh, uh, from Mr. Director General Jean Luc Paquet um, from the European Commission. So, um, Let's listen to the final statement from our Minister for Higher Education, Research and Innovation, uh, Madame Vidal. She couldn't come, but she left us very um, important messages, so let's listen to them. Monsieur le Ministre Tchèque de l'Education, de la Jeunesse et des Sports, uh, cher Pietre, Monsieur le Directeur de la Recherche et de l'Innovation de la Commission Européenne, cher Jean-Éric, Mesdames et Messieurs les parlementaires européens, chers collègues, Mesdames et Messieurs. Au nom de la présidence française du Conseil de l'Union européenne, je suis heureuse de vous dire quelques mots à l'occasion de la conférence d'anniversaire des 20 ans du Forum stratégique européen des infrastructures de recherche dans les locaux de l'Institut de France et sous le haut patronage de l'Académie des sciences, lieu emblématique de l'Europe de la connaissance. La politique commune des infrastructures montre notre capacité de projection sur le long terme. Mais cette projection ne nous fait bien sûr nullement oublier l'urgence, celle de la terrible situation en Ukraine, celle du soutien aux Ukrainiens. L'Union européenne et la France sont fortement mobilisées pour apporter des réponses rapides et adaptées. Mon ministère et ses opérateurs sont à pied d'œuvre pour accueillir dans les meilleures conditions les étudiants en provenance d'Ukraine. De même, j'ai renforcé l'accompagnement social, mais aussi en santé mentale des étudiants déjà présents sur notre territoire. En outre, un programme exceptionnel a été lancé dès le 1er mars pour accueillir les scientifiques en danger. Je salue la très forte mobilisation de nos établissements d'enseignement supérieur et de recherche, de nos organismes de recherche, des CRUS et des associations qui œuvrent au service de ces personnes déplacées qui fuient l'horreur de la guerre. Les infrastructures de recherche européennes sont au cœur des découvertes scientifiques. Elles représentent un actif précieux dans lequel nos pays investissent pour construire l'avenir de l'Europe dans le domaine de la recherche et de l'innovation et pour accompagner les grandes transitions dans lesquelles nous sommes engagés. Il y a 20 ans, en 2002, les pays européens ont décidé de créer le SFRI, European Strategic Forum for Research Infrastructures, devenu une clé de voûte du réseau d'infrastructures de recherche de l'Union européenne au rayonnement mondial. La conférence d'aujourd'hui a illustré le caractère résolument pionnier et stratégique de cette politique d'équipement qu'aucun État membre ne serait en mesure de financer seul. Cette conférence a réuni des représentants des États, des régions, des industriels, des responsables d'installations et d'équipements scientifiques, et bien entendu, d'éminents scientifiques et de jeunes chercheurs pour échanger autour de travaux et de découvertes majeures ayant bénéficié de ces infrastructures de recherche européennes. Cette conférence a aussi permis de mesurer la dynamique de développement du paysage européen en matière d'infrastructures de recherche, paysage qui n'a cessé de croître au cours des 20 dernières années grâce aux efforts communs de tous les États européens. La pandémie de Covid-19 a démontré à quel point notre société dépend de la recherche et de l'innovation pour trouver des solutions à des problèmes de grande ampleur. Or, les ruptures scientifiques et technologiques, ainsi que la réponse aux grands défis de notre temps, nécessitent l'utilisation d'infrastructures de recherche au meilleur niveau. Dans des champs disciplinaires beaucoup plus nombreux que par le passé, ces infrastructures sont devenues d'incroyables moteurs de savoir et d'innovation, des attracteurs de talents, des catalyseurs de collaboration, des porteurs d'images et de prestige scientifique. Au service de la communauté scientifique, elles sont un outil essentiel pour la compétitivité de la recherche et de l'innovation. Par leur statut de promoteur de nouvelles pratiques, elles constituent également un vecteur idéal 
pour le transfert de connaissances et de technologies vers le monde socio-économique. Depuis 20 ans désormais, le SFRI accompagne le développement d'infrastructures européennes qui transforme les pratiques des communautés scientifiques et définit les priorités européennes en matière d'investissement dans les infrastructures de recherche à travers l'élaboration de feuilles de route par la communauté scientifique. Lieu de recherche, d'innovation, de formation, les infrastructures de recherche européennes concourent à bâtir une Europe plus souveraine. Elles sont productrices de connaissances et de compétences nouvelles permettant d'accélérer les transitions climatiques, numériques, l'avancée des connaissances dans le domaine de la santé et d'améliorer la compétitivité de l'Union pour renforcer sa résilience face aux potentielles crises comme celle de la Covid-19. Plus que jamais, les enjeux scientifiques posent le défi de construire des outils de recherche à la pointe des connaissances scientifiques et technologiques. Les efforts engagés ces 20 dernières années au sein de l'ESFRI sont essentiels. Ils ont permis de doter l'Europe d'une vision stratégique de développement des infrastructures de recherche européennes, positionnées dans une véritable analyse du paysage européen en la matière. Interface entre le monde académique, le monde économique, les autorités publiques et la société, à la croisée de la recherche, de l'innovation et de l'enseignement supérieur, les infrastructures de recherche européennes sont des acteurs fondamentaux dans la mobilisation des forces de l'UE pour préparer l'Europe de demain. Les travaux de la mise à jour de la feuille de route se sont achevés en décembre 2021. Cette feuille de route combine les ESFRI Projects, qui sont au nombre de 22, de nouvelles infrastructures de recherche en cours de mise en œuvre, et les ESFRI Landmark, 41, qui sont des infrastructures déjà fonctionnelles. La France accompagne depuis plus de 20 ans maintenant le développement d'infrastructures nationales et européennes qui transforment les pratiques des communautés scientifiques. Elle est membre de 48 infrastructures de recherche sur 63. Ces 48 infrastructures européennes sont également inscrites sur la feuille de route nationale des infrastructures de recherche, dont la nouvelle version vient d'être publiée début mars. Les infrastructures de recherche doivent ainsi figurer sans complexe au premier rang des priorités européennes, fortes de la certitude que des équipements d'excellence soutiennent les projets ambitieux et innovants, français et européens, au meilleur niveau scientifique international. Je vous remercie. And uh, we will also have a pleasure to listen to the message uh, from the Minister of Education, Youth and Sport from Czech Republic, Mr. Petr Gazik. Dear Madam Minister, dear Madam Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank the French Presidency for inviting me to address on this occasion of the conference commemorating the 20th anniversary of the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures. Despite I wasn't able to come to Paris due to other working commitments, I'm very glad and truly honored to join this event, at least virtually, and congratulate ESFRI on its 20th birthday via video. As I said today, we are recalling 20 years of ESFRI two decades of the forum which provides European research infrastructure stakeholders a high-level platform to debate the most pressing research infrastructure challenges and come up with expert advice on how to resolve them. In these past 20 years, ESFRI has come a long way. ESFRI is publishing strategy reports on the European research infrastructures ESFRI is monitoring the performance and the implementation progress of new projects. ESFRI is also elaborating position, paper and in-depth studies. Czechia shall address research infrastructure as one of the top priorities of the Czech EU Council Presidency. Our high-level goal and objective is to adopt uh, the EU Council conclusion on research infrastructures to be endorsed be 
uh, by the research configuration of the EU Competitiveness Council. We are also planning to facilitate preparation of the Bruno Declaration on Research Infrastructures. The aim of this declaration is to invite research infrastructure stakeholders all around the world to develop a fully integrated research infrastructures ecosystem. ESPRI has been the key source of guidance and inspiration for us when drafting the drill versions of the EU Council conclusions and the Brno Declaration on Research Infrastructures. In particular, let me stress out of the S3 white paper from 2020 and the 2021 publication of S3 roadmap, which have been extremely helpful. Having said that, let me wish all the best to S3 and let S3 be at least and successful in the next 20 years as it was in these past two decades. Last but not least, congratulations and my most sincere appreciation to all of you who have made S3 happen. Thank you very much for attention. Voilà, et là, ça va être vraiment fini. Euh, je, je vais vous prendre vraiment qu'une minute ou deux. Non, je vais utiliser le, ce micro. D'abord, pour euh, remercier euh, aussi au nom de Maria Gabriel, euh, Yana Collard, euh, euh, avec l'Institut de France, de nous avoir aujourd'hui si bien accueillis, y compris avec vous, Elena. Merci infiniment. C'était vraiment euh, un grand plaisir. Et je comprends euh, de ce que mes collègues me disent que la tenue des travaux scientifiques euh, durant la journée a aussi répondu à vos attentes. Et j'ai aucun doute que cela permettra euh, aux, aux, aux collègues impliqués dans ESFRI d'amener effectivement euh, cette, euh, cette, ces, ces infrastructures européennes de recherche euh, dans, dans les deux prochaines décennies. ESFRI a été au cœur de l'espace européen de la recherche, a été vraiment le succès le plus visible, pas le seul, mais le plus visible de l'espace européen de la recherche. Grâce à ESFRI, nous bénéficions en Europe des meilleures infrastructures de recherche. Nous continuons d'y investir et c'est certainement l'enjeu aussi des 20 prochaines années. Vos succès vous porteront, je n'ai aucun doute, sur ces 20 prochaines années. Et je me réjouis avec tous mes collègues de la Commission de travailler maintenant avec la présidence tchèque après les travaux en cours avec la française et de travailler avec ESFRI pour effectivement mettre à disposition du monde et des scientifiques européens ces infrastructures nous permettant de produire la connaissance et les résultats dont nous avons besoin. Encore merci, encore bon anniversaire et au plaisir de travailler ensemble. Vous êtes tous, bonne soirée à tous.